Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Bandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Welcome to The Total Connector Show. My name is Kay Bandavani. Um, I have three special guests. Um, it's Robert Breedlove. Raul Paul and Eric Vasquil. For the first time, Raul Paul is on my show. Thank you so much for coming, Raul. Uh, I've been watching your your great, I don't know, presentations, videos, following your viral uh, threads going <laughs> off. <laughs> and um, uh, the reason, you know, for it, you know, the name of my show is the Total Connector. Um, just to you know, say it very simply, it's uh, the intention behind it is to bring people from different perspectives and fields as you do also and uh, because you know you're also an expert on macroeconomic geopolitics finance uh, connecting the dots and I thought you know with Robert Breedlove and Eric Rosquiel let me just do a short introduction uh, of, of you guys and then you can maybe you know introduce yourself a little bit so um, let me start with Raul Raul is a uh, a global macro investor, Real Vision Group, uh, a founder and CEO of Real Vision Group. Um, he's also a business cycle economist, investment strategist, economic historian, a traveler, and a rum drinker. I like that because I love rum too. So, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and he's got this uh, um, really must listen, must see uh, channel on YouTube. It's called Real Vision Finance. Uh, with the really uh, uh, most prolific experts in their respective fields. Um, uh, Eric, uh, as you guys, uh, my viewers and listeners already know, he's an entrepreneur, uh, software architect, core Bitcoin developer, investor, naval aviator, ex-Top Gun, <laughs> military, uh, Top Gun uh, uh, flight in- instructor, traveler, martial artist. <laughs> And Robert Breedlove is uh, the CEO of um, his, he, he writes wonderful articles and uh, delivers wonderful materials on Bitcoin, on the understanding comprehension of Bitcoin also, like Eric also does with his Libid articles. Uh, he's a CEO, um, uh, CFO, CEO, CIO with broad spectrum leadership experience across the entire tech, consumer tech, corporate finance, international M&A, tech strategy, wealth management, blockchain, and crypto asset domains. And he's currently the chief executive officer and chief investment officer of Parallax Digital, a professional services team, a firm specializing in digital asset investment management and consulting for the emerging digital security space. All right, it goes on and on. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Would you just introduce yourself uh, a little bit or your path uh, because it's focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Uh, in this show, um, what do you want to tell about yourself? Thank you so much for coming again. So, who, 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 goes, who goes first? <laughs> Go ahead, Roll. Okay. Uh, so, my background is I'm, I'm uh, English, half Indian, half Dutch. Grew up in England. Uh, my background's finance. So, different to everybody here, I was at Goldman Sachs, where I started and managed the hedge fund sales business in equities and equity derivatives. I then went to run a global macro hedge fund for the largest hedge fund firm in Europe and then uh, went out on my own, semi-retired, moved to the Mediterranean coast of Spain where I started writing macroeconomic and investment strategy. So Austrian economics was actually one of my things that I looked at and I learned about the business cycle and I started developing my own theories on the business cycle and how the business cycle affects asset prices and the predictability of the business cycle. Within that whole world, back in about 2013, um, some friends of mine who'd set up a Bitcoin exchange um, started talking to me about Bitcoin. And I became an investor at that period um, as soon as I heard about it because I realized that it was potentially an answer to a lot of the issues that the financial system was facing. Um, particularly at the time, we were having a European crisis and the banking system was almost going. I was living in Spain at the time mm-hmm. and the issue was going to be who the hell owns what who owns collateral, who owns custody, all of these things that are such a complicated mess and blockchain and Bitcoin seems to be the answer to all of that. So there's a little brief thing from, and I live in the Cayman Islands um, and mainly in a small island called Little Cayman, an island of 140 people in the middle of nowhere. Wow, thank you so much. Robert, Eric, Robert, go ahead. 
please. Yeah, thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Robert Breedlove. I uh, grew up in Tennessee. I now live in Los Angeles. Uh, I've been a lifelong economics nerd. I've been studying history and, and macro since I was a kid, actually. Um, as I, I told you on the intro to the last podcast, I kind of got involved with digital assets before there were digital assets. Uh, I learned about trading online, actually through video games at a very young age. And then most recently in my adult career, I've been a CFO for a number of finance and tech companies, uh, most recently founding Parallax Digital. Um, and we focus, uh, for a hedge fund, focused on digital assets. And we're also spinning up a consulting practice for, focused on digital securities. <coughs> Awesome, yes. Eric. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm Eric. I have a, I, I got a computer science degree uh, back in the day. Uh, joined the Navy because uh, I was bored at IBM and in my internship, and did ten years there. Flew, uh, flew Hornets and uh, um, taught tactics, and then uh, I kept writing software. Got out to do a startup in '98, and. Uh, 2006, sold my first one to Microsoft, and then uh, did another one, sold that off to Veritas Capital, did another one to tank that one. And I started working on Bitcoin, um, and I kind of have a bit of a company there, but most of it's just open source and writing uh, economic stuff. Um, I started looking at uh, digital cash stuff uh, with uh, Chomian Cash back in the mid-90s, even contacted those guys. Uh, one of their founders has my name actually i'm dutch uh i'm, the I'm half dutch yeah well i'm, yeah. I'm technically made for quarter, uh you know one grandparent um but it's my name yeah i actually got back to my old ancestral uh two hometowns uh, when i was there last month uh, uh so I, I do a lot of i do a lot of traveling i've been to i think 80 countries now uh, a lot of motorcycle trips i did i did uh 10 countries in europe in june and uh, I try to mix that up with Bitcoin speaking and, and stuff. Um, uh, what was I going to say? So I, uh, I started working on the Bitcoin um, about, um, it's coming up on six years now, I guess. Um, I've been, I've been uh, done a lot of work in that. I don't know, I think we have about a half million lines of code, uh, full implementation. Uh, Libit Bitcoin's the second uh, full implementation of Bitcoin. Uh, started in 2011 by Amir Taki. Um, I, uh, as a consequence of that, I, I'm also kind of a economics nerd, and uh, you know, certainly uh, Austrian. And um, I used to call myself a libertarian. I'm, now I'm an anarchist. Rothbard put me over the edge. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, that's been a while now too. Um, uh, I tend to I tend to quote Rothbard because I think he's the clearest and most current uh, of the uh, Austrian um, giants. And uh, and I've done a lot of my writing, uh, a lot of writing on my own and, and speaking, um, I don't know, 10 or 15 conferences or so, and I've got a couple more coming up on, uh, mostly on crypto economics. I prefer to speak on that over uh, over the Bitcoin. Um, just find it, it's more engaging to the audience um, than a bunch of technical stuff. And uh, so I've done about 90, I think 92 topics as of yet <coughs> on uh, crypto economic stuff. And what's happened is that's kind of bled more into pure economics because most of the uh, most of the arguments you see about things are for people not understanding. Um, and then I found some things I consider errors and and even Rothbard stuff, which I, I was surprised at uh, over time. So uh, anyway, that's that's what I do. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so what I thought it, um, it would be a good segue um, is the the last uh, you know prominent Twitter thread of Raul, which went pretty vile, um, and you you know you brought up a bunch of really important uh, points, which I think sometimes, you know, are these uh, understatements even, um, you know, this, this show is also directed at um, newbies, uh, especially, you know, Bitcoin newbies. So maybe you can, you guys can help us, uh, can help me for our viewers and listeners to give a little, sort of a bigger holistic picture, macroeconomically, geopolitically, like zooming out and then zooming in. Um, let me just read a, a couple of quotes that you, because it, I think it's really a good segue. You wrote something about, um, you know, um, the negative yielding, uh, the $15 trillion of negative yielding debt. Um, then uh, you also talked about the end of pension system and a huge loss of wealth for baby boomer retirees, uh, etc. plus freezing of the corporate credit markets. Um, 
everything that's going on right now in the world, um, can you like give, um, without using too much technical macroeconomical jargon, because, you know, we got to pick up the people where they are, uh, like, as if you would maybe explain it to a seven year old child sometimes, I thought, just to, you know, make the comprehension process a little bit um, easier for people to grasp and to connect the dots and what does it have to do the bridging or the the connection to bitcoin what's the implication the effects short term mid term long term what does it mean for the average person out there so from my perspective it's all about debt deflation and demographics once you understand that the world financialized at the highest rates in all recorded history so the fractional reserve banking system, the banking system we know where banks can create money and lend money, became out of control from the 1980s onwards. And the growth of debt became the predominant feature of our financial system. That's all well and good. Debt can be a great thing until it gets to a point where it becomes difficult to repay. Now, the difficulty to repay becomes an issue um, when you've got two things. One is falling inflation, which is called deflation because the size of your debt goes up every year if the prices, the relative prices of goods fall. Secondly, is if your population that supports that debt is old, then you have a problem because they, they, they move into the retirement phase of life and therefore are not at peak earnings any longer and they're drawing down from their savings. So, but they're stuck with, saddled with huge debts. It's a function of very typical in Japan where it happened first, um, the households were lucky, they didn't have so much debt, but the government and corporations and the financial system are extremely in debt and they're still paying for that problem 30 years post their bubble peak. Next was up was Europe and Switzerland, um, where they had older populations and back in 2000, their stock markets peaked and their financial system almost imploded going into 2013 because of the same issue, debt demographics. You think of it, that's the pension system as well. All of these old people don't have enough money in their pensions that they wish to have. Uh, we're now moving into the phase where the average American baby boomer, which is the big bulge bracket of population, is 65 years old. The average retirement age in America is 65 year old. And the amount of debt that they carry and those around them that carry um, is enormous. So the big issue in the US is currently corporate debt. <clears throat> The pensions that these baby boomers have, they own all of the corporate debt, which is enormous. So what you have is a, um, a, a large debt burden that is ba backed by, when we move into the Bitcoin world, we have fiat currency, which is a currency not backed by um, anything specifically. So it can be printed in unlimited amounts to pay off that debt. And that's, that's the issue we've got too. And we almost brought the world to its knees in 2012 when Europe went bust. You know, living in Europe, having had to buy a generator for my house, hold cash, buy food because Cyprus had gone and I thought Spain was next. Cyprus, they shut out the entire, they, they bailed in the entire banking system. They took money from everybody's accounts and basically wiped out the entire financial sector in one go. I thought it was going to happen. It came so damn close that I realized that there had to be some other answer for this. Um, and it was all, it's all driven by the same thing. If we're not through it yet. It's a big kind of secular unwind and that's why within all of this the whole kind of bitcoin uh, infrastructure is something that has an opportunity to change some of this trajectory at the end wonderful do you think we are in a phase where uh, you know we, we hear about bust and boom cycles we are on the precipice that you know i mean how how long can the system postpone the implosion of this system you know or, or is it sort of a cycle cyclical thing that goes on and on and on so we're if you're a you know business cycle economist like myself you're basically in the um probability game so you know you have long-term cycles secular cycles so the credit cycle is a secular cycle you also have shorter term which is the business cycle when the business cycle rolls over which is what's happened now so let's say germany is now in recession japan is heading towards recession china is pretty much in recession south korea singapore hong kong everybody's kind of rolling over again to recession probably the us comes so in recessions at a very simple level in recessions bad things happen so if you ha if you're in the middle of a secular unwind 
which is the great duck unwind, then the chance of something bad happening in a recession within that is high. So we had it in 2008, and we've got it again coming up now. So the chances that something, something ugly within that situation comes out. So when we step back and say, okay, what is that? Well, when we look at the kind of the logical conclusion of, of what we're doing, governments, are, central banks are now buying the debt of the, of the governments that issue it. And that's all fine. But then eventually you get, it's not blown up the world, it's created some distortions. But when you get to Japan, which has been doing it longer than everybody else, they own 70% of their entire bond market. So by the next recession, the one that they're entering into now, they're going to own all of their bond market. So now you're into the big monetary experiment. Can you write off all of the debt in one go, magic, and there's no consequences? There is a school of economic thought called MMT that would suggest there is no consequence. <laughs> a classical understanding would be you're probably going to nuke your currency. Um, now, Japan is the first country where that's going to reach that proportion. Europe is next. You're in Austria. Europe is the next part of that equation. They're going to get to the very precipice because their banking sector is almost going, it's almost rolling off the cliff and going bankrupt, and it will happen in the next recession. And the European governments will have to bail out the banking system, and the central bank will have to do that, and they will own all of the bonds. So we're getting to the logical conclusion where the, press, uh, the premise of fiat currency is going to get tested because of the largesse of central banks. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, what we're headed to. And that's why I think the timing right now is incredibly important. Could this not be the one? It's possible. You'd have to have a very mild recession for this not to be the big one. Um, and that is, you know, there is a reasonable probability of that, call it 50-50. But that 50% odds of it being a really big problem, well, that's far too big for anybody to ignore. Wow, thank you so much for that comprehensive <laughs> summary. Um, okay, Robert, uh, Eric, I mean, do you have like a, a complementary perspective to that? Or how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you see this whole situation? I mean, do you yeah. think the euro could even crash like in the next few quartals? Uh, because that's what I heard from other experts in Europe. Just that add a little context to what Raul was saying. Um, you know, debt go getting out of hand beginning kind of in the 80s, uh, arguably a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, Austrian economists would argue that that is a direct, uh, direct result of the severance to the gold peg in 1971. Um, when currencies moved away from being redeemable for gold, which is basically their anchor to economic reality, right, the reality of scarcity, um, the, the restrictions were lifted and they were totally able to go out and accumulate as much debt as possible. Um, and I think to this point, the financialization of the world really um, started to skyrocket after that. Um, this, you know, actually, there's, we distinguish between hard and soft money um, in a lot of our writings. And you know, hard money being, say, gold or Bitcoin, for instance, so that there is a cost to produce uh, money that has skin in the game, money that's anchored to the reality of scarcity, versus soft money, which is fiat currency that can be reproduced endlessly. Um, and, and a lot of people don't understand this, but every time you're producing additional fiat currency, uh, the effect commonly called inflation, which we're all accustomed to, it's actually a reallocation of wealth um, from the citizens forced to use that currency into the hands of those that get money first, uh, commonly called the Cantillon effect. So I would say that uh, the, the debt thing has gone wild. In my perspective, we're kind of at the very tail end of this uh, monetary policy experiment where we've been, you know, we've uh, centralized banking. Uh, the Fed was started in, what, 1913. Uh, they gradually reduced redeemability for gold, eventually silvering it in 1971. We now have uh, the state basically acquiring uh, all the hard assets of an economy, you know, moving from a, a free market to more of a socialistic type structure, uh, as we're seeing in Japan. So I think it is uh, definitely a consequence of the obstructions we've put in the free market. Um, and I think that I, I agree, the next recession will be defining. Um, it's hard to tell what type it will be. 
Uh, it seems like we might be on the precipice of a sovereign debt bubble. Um, but in any event, you know, Bitcoin really does offer this alternative foundation um, to a new economic system that's, that, again, is founded in reality, uh, anchored to the reality of scarcity. So I think that's very exciting that we have some alternative to the mess we've gotten ourselves into. Eric, uh, you know, remember when we talked about uh, you, you are the one <laughs> who always reminds me that Bitcoin is about separation of state, government and money, or it's about creating the black market, or I would call it even freedom market because it's permissionless, right? It is decentralized, it's open and, it, you know, the cat is out of the bag. Do you think because of this process, more and more people obviously or, you know, uh, conspicuously or a secret or whatever, especially the people now who are trying to escape with their wealth into a hard, you know, scarce money or scarcest money such as Bitcoin are doing it like at a, you know, at a, at a pace of speed that is, has never been done before. Like, could it, could it happen that we could just all of a sudden have a black market, like a freedom market with, you know, billions of people? Could that happen in the next few years? Uh, I don't make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> If, if anything, economics uh, is a uh, a uh, dynamical system, right? And uh, predicting it is is an act of futility. So uh, I don't I don't I don't look at things that way. But um, as far as um, a money um, from being permissionless, uh, it's only permissionless to the extent that people are willing to break the law, right? Pass a law, you obey it. It's no longer permissionless. Now you're asking for permission. So that's what um, I try to remind people it's um, you know, Bitcoin is, is only permissionless to the extent that you will not ask for permission or you will not allow people to tell you what to do, um, which essentially makes it a black market money, right? Um, because if you rely on uh, the state to give you that permission, you're not going to be any better off than any other money that's currently permitted by the state. Um, Bitcoin is just too small right now for state to care enough. They, you know, if it becomes impactful enough, in other words, affecting uh, what is essentially tax revenue, um, they'll care. You know, uh, I assume they'll care, but, uh, you know, you can't predict how much they'll care or how much people will be willing to resist. Um, but the only way you could possibly resist is by breaking the law, right? So, um, I don't know. Did I, did I answer your question? There's a lot of things I could talk about, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, you want to, um, uh, what Raul and Robert uh, said, um, uh, give your perspective on the bigger picture? Um, well, like I said, a lot of it, um, it, it, it kind of goes against my, uh, making comments about the future, what will happen, what's likely to happen, what's a probability, what will happen, kind of goes mm -hmm. against my, uh, my nature. But um, uh, I can pick out a couple of things. Uh, say, you know, Bitcoin being a refuge, going, going back to a, uh, you know, a, a money that uh, costs as much to produce as its face value. I mean, even dollar bills have a cost to produce, right? It's 5.5 .5 cents per $1 bill and discounted as they go up. But the difference is um, dollars and other similar state monies um, have, mon have a monopoly on production, right? You make them yourself, you're a counterfeiter, that's illegal. And that's what gives the state the ability to make them at well below their face value. Otherwise everybody would do it and then, there'd be, then they would be at their face value and that would be called commodity money. And that does happen, right? Um, uh, that does happen and when that happens, it, those bills go out of circulation and it happens quite frequently actually. So um, once, a, once a money no longer uh, benefits from that monopoly protection, it just uh, ceases to exist. Um, but, okay, so it's that monopoly protection that gives state money uh, the ability to um, tax uh, seniorage, right, it's, which is um, their monopoly privilege because they're the state and they can enforce those uh, counter any counterfeiting laws. Um, what I find interesting, and I, I started to kind of try to remind people this, is that what's the definition of fiat? Fiat is not something that has a declared value by fiat. It's declared to be money by fiat, right? Um, but that's not really the meaning. The, the, the technical definition of fiat is that it has no use value, right? Gold has use value, silver has use value. 
you know, everything that kind of physically exists has some use value, even dollars that can be burned for heat. But the presumption of a fiat is that it doesn't have a material use value, right? Well, Bitcoin's a fiat. Bitcoin has no material use value. It can be used for time stamping, but we don't consider that a material aspect of its value. It actually depends on the dollar value, right? Or the, or the monetary value. So we have these two monies. One is a monopoly money and one is a non-monopoly money, but they're both fiat. <laughs> so I, I, tend to, I tend to not like the term fiat being used to just describe you know, all state money, but that's, that has been the history. It wasn't possible for anybody to even imagine a fiat that wasn't uh, protected by, um, by monopoly privilege because fiat is printed on paper, plastic and stuff, right? But we found another way to do it. We have a no use value money um, that costs as much to produce as its face value. Um, so can, can Bitcoin as, as this um, non-monopoly, I call it market money, right? We have this market money, which effectively is similar to commodity money. Uh, and that it costs as much to produce as it's as it's uh, trading for. Um, is it possible that that kind of replaces the, you know something similar to the gold standard, right? Well, I think what people people have a hard time understanding the distinction between money and credit. Um, we talked a lot about debt, but you know credit's the other side of debt. It's the same thing, right? So um, there's, in terms of U.S. dollars, there's probably uh, 3.2 trillion now if you count uh, Fed obligations, which are the yet-to-be-printed dollars they account for anyway. Uh, they don't really have to print them until they, you know, somebody orders them, but but they're all accounted for. Um, and so you take a you take an economy that's uh, if you add up equities, public and private, that that are accounted for, uh, bond market and bank credit, you're about $95 trillion or something like that. I'm trying to find it on my spreadsheet here anyway. It's a lot of, a lot of dough. Yeah, about $95 trillion. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the money to credit ratio for US dollar uh, denominated securities. Um, so that's a big difference, right? <laughs> so we talk about Bitcoin replacing a money, just talk about it replacing the dollar. Well, that's 3.2 trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin, but that's $95 trillion worth of debt. Now, replacing the money doesn't get rid of the debt or the credit, right? If there's no credit, there's no production, right? Credit is the source of all production, lending. So, so you ask yourself, well, how do you create lendable Bitcoin that has the same security properties of Bitcoin? You don't, you can't. Um, so whether you think about it as a Bitcoin backed money or a Bitcoin backed, you know, account based, you know, uh, system, it, it doesn't really make any difference, right? The money gets lent. Now it's credit money. Um, so that's just an, uh, you know, an economic observation, but the other, you know, the other one that we, we talked about before is the black market versus white market issue of, of, uh, you know, it being fairly trivial to, um, make it permissioned in the white market. Um, so, you know, if you look at the size of the black market, it's about you know, 25 there maybe 30% of the world economy is, is, you know, not accounted for, um, not visible, dark. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty significant amount of money backing a similar proportion of credit. Um, could Bitcoin replace all of that? without being able to touch the white market because, you know, it's money laundering? Uh, probably not because people have to trade in the white market, right? People, black market people don't just use gold, they want dollars because they want to buy other stuff, right? So some fraction of the black market seems perfectly reasonable. I mean, it's already there, right? Um, but I, I try to remind people of those things when they're doing, you know, projections on you know, maximum market cap of Bitcoin. You're not talking about the credit. You're not talking about the hundred, you know, the ninety-five trillion dollar U.S. economy. You're talking about the number of dollars that are backing that, because Bitcoin is a money, not credit. Um, anyway, I'm just rambling on about uh, you know price estimates and stuff. We could talk about bubbles and whatever, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I guess chime in on uh, you know the difference between white and black markets. Uh, I think is a very arbitrary distinction, actually. Uh, it was Rothbard that said there's no entity called government, just groups of people calling themselves government and acting in a governmental manner. Um, 
you know, frankly, digital technologies have been shattering regulatory frameworks for decades, right? I think Uber was illegal in every city that it was launched. Um, you know, Steve Jobs went toe to toe with uh, a lot of the traditional record companies. Uh, I see it more as Bitcoin, you know, disintermediating the market for money. Whereas today, maybe there will be a law passed against its use or whatever, but over time, um, kind of the digital nature of it reforms the existing regulatory framework. Um, and that gets back to the game theory of Bitcoin, which is, is often overlooked. But, you know, at its very core level, Bitcoin is converting electricity and individual self-interest into indisputable truth and expansion of its network. It's incentivizing everyone that interacts with it um, to adopt it and expand its network further. And that dynamic holds true at the individual level, at the central bank level, at the nation state level. Um, it's, it's truly scale uh, agnostic, so. Well, I'd, I'd respond to that by the, the definition of the black market versus the white market is very clear. It's what's legal and what's not, right? Um, whether it's just or not, is a totally different question. Um, the question of whether um, whether Bitcoin as a money can disintermediate the state is, is a different question than you're talking about with, say, you know, the power of, uh, of new technologies in general, because the state has a monopoly on money and it wants that monopoly badly, mm -hmm. right? So we're not talking about Uber stepping in and saying, you know, we'll take over the army, <laughs> right? But no, no, we're going to do that. That's our monopoly, right? We have that privilege and we're going to keep it. Um, yeah, they're disrupting some local taxi monopolies for sure, right? The New York, you know, kind of taxi medallion, but they really didn't, right? They circumvented it um, by being non-hailing cabs. So still operating within the law. Uh, I mean, the law has changed to try to try to keep them out and all that. But but we're talking about the state level, the, the nation state level monopoly on money that exists in almost every piece of earth on the planet, right? So um, I, again, I don't, make predictions, but presumably the reason Bitcoin has the security model it has is so that it can survive when it's not allowed. And that implies that somebody is going to not allow it, right? If somebody doesn't care, great, no problem, right? But when you analyze, you know, when you look at the security model, it's designed to, um, it's designed to allow people to operate, you know, without permission. Um, it's, my understanding that you know if the state cares the first thing my, my, my belief anyway that if it cares the first thing it'll do is do the easiest thing is just to pass a law second thing it'll do is try to enforce that law and that'll be difficult and it'll eventually go to a hash power attack because it's the easiest right it's sent you can do it all in one place all <coughs> around the world so bitcoin has that weakness but you know the the, the assumption that the state will just give up not only tax on money which is significant right 90 94.5 cents on every one dollar bill but also give up um its ability to see what everybody's doing with their money which is probably more significant right that's how they enforce all the other taxes um uh seems like it's not it's not assured by the security model right there's nothing in the security model that guards against that not if you're willing to obey the law so uh, it's different that's all i'm saying I agree with you completely in the distinction. Uh, I guess my only point is that legality is fluid. So something that may be black market today could become white market tomorrow. <coughs> gold, be yeah. gold became legal again. That did happen. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Gold was However, a great Gold thing. became legal once it was no longer relevant, right? Once the economy was largely electronic, then they said, yeah, you can do this stuff now. <laughs> once, they, once they held enough of the market to control it, I think they re reauthorized private ownership. But I guess the point I'm th making is a little bit different from just the legal perspective. It is the game theory, right? If say an autocratic country adopts Bitcoin as a reserve asset today, North Korea or whoever, um, that puts every other nation state in a position where they're, to protect their own self-interest and national security, they have to consider adopting it as well. So I, I, did, I hear this term that reforms legality is my only point. Yeah, yeah, I hear this term game theory thrown around a lot and I've yet to see anybody do an analysis, like actual game theory analysis on it. So I tried it. Um, somebody mentioned prisoner's dilemma in the specific scenario you're talking about. And, uh, I can't find a prisoner's dilemma scenario that actually applies, which has to meet specific criteria. 
Hmm. Um, so that's something to look at. If you're, I've got a topic written up, and Kayvon can probably probably post the link. Uh, it's called "Prisoner's Dilemma Fallacy." But hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's the terms used very loosely, and and I actually I look very closely at these things, and I want to. I'm I'm just really searching for truth most of the time. Um, I don't really care how it comes out, um, but I, I have yet to see a single instance of game theory actually apply to anything in Bitcoin. Re really what you're talking about is a market. And um, yeah, people have interests. They may have common interests, but that doesn't make it game theory. So, you know, when, I, when we talk about black market, it's always relative, right? What's legal and not legal is always relative to whoever declared it. Right? So it may be legal in the West, the G8, whatever, G20, uh, or maybe legal there, maybe legal everywhere else. But that's, that's irrelevant to the concept I'm putting forth, which is black versus white relative to whoever you're talking about, right? So we have this black market relative to those countries. I mean, white market, and then we have the black market might be North Korea, Iran, you know, Ireland, I don't know. And uh, that doesn't really change anything. It just It's just a description of the size of the black market, right? The question is, can the black market overpower the, the white market for the, the force that's enforcing the law, right? And that comes down to whether they're willing to pay more in fees on their transactions than the, than the enforcing state is willing to pay in taxes to subsidize a hash war, right? It's just a question of taking, taking lower fee transactions. So um, that's not knowable. Well, who's willing to pay more, right? It's value is subjective. And uh, we don't know how much the state will be willing to tax, how much the taxpayer is willing, willing to cough up or how much the people who want to get their black market trans or their unauthorized transactions confirmed will pay to get them confirmed. But if they pay enough, yeah. people will rise on those transactions, mm -hmm. hash power will be incented, black market miners will mine them, and they'll overpower the state. But that's that's just not knowable. And it doesn't matter where the black market is, whether yeah. it's a whole state. Yeah, matter. see, Eric, I mean, I, be I truly believe um, what whatever Trace Mai was it with his network effects or um, Anthony Pompliano, I think, talking about uh, China, you know, there's strict capital controls, right, Raul? I mean, there's like, what, $27 trillion deposits or something? And if just 1% of that went into capital flight or what do you call a capital escape into Bitcoin, because you got this quote, and by the way, Kate Long agreed with you. She retweeted yours. You said it trades Bitcoin. It trades like a call option on a new system. You want to yeah, comment on that? I don't agree with any of this discussion we're having right now because I don't see Bitcoin as money. I think the definition of money is wrong. I think what we're seeing is a revolution in the understanding of what money could be and how money can be um, have a mu multiple purposes. So I don't think it's just um, Bitcoin. I think it's it's the digitization of assets, the digital value of all assets. It is the it's um, currencies and tokenization along with blockchain there's a whole number of parts of this and there's elements of what makes money and what isn't money and what is money in new society and what parts of money can you trade separately they don't all have to be one thing so within that it actually becomes an, essentially an operate once you understand at a philosophic level how this could fit into a number of different parts you know like somebody on real vision called, referred to as the security truth machine somebody else thinks of it as digital gold and then somebody else thinks of it as this there's a whole number of things it's basically an operating system for both not only a financial system, but also recorded ownership of all assets. So in the new digital world that we come into. So the whole concept is much broader. So for me, if I look at what Bitcoin is to me, it's not money, I'd never use it as money right now. Maybe when it gets to it, when everything's mined and it has some stability, um, you know, call it, use plan B's methodology of $100 trillion is where we get to in the final, great. In the meantime, it is and can only be a call option because all the future is unknowable um, and we have so many probabilities on where this could lead to and what it is. We, we literally don't know, we, so we can all pontificate all day. But the reality is, is you have to think of it as a call option on the future. So if you get closer to an end game of some sorts, which many of us think that there is some sort of systemic change of, of how we approach the financial system, well then the probability goes up that this is worth a lot of money. If that end game goes away, the probability goes down. So yes, it, in it, but in its own right, it has the adoption cycle and another um, number of elements. It's not a very easy thing. So the stock flow model does work to a certain extent, but it also, that stock flow model is a, is a um, reflection also of that probability and option pricing model. Well, it, it sounds like uh, to me, when you call it uh, you know, a call option, you're, you're calling it a speculation vehicle, right? No. 
So well, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant, right? It's absolutely irrelevant whether it's speculative or not. I can speculate in gold. I can speculate in... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, it's not a pejorative or anything. I'm just saying that that's, it, you know, but it has to speculate on something happening. No, not necessarily. Well, it depends what you mean by speculation. speculation Again, it's, speculation it's, on price, right? it's definitional, right? Uh, it's fundamental, yeah. Yeah. Um, the future is unknowable. Speculation, is the speculation on some future price. Right? For something. Yeah. Yeah. A, ref a reflection or speculation of some future potential price. Yeah. So that thing has to be actual, right? Or, or the speculative error is 100%. Correct. And it always can be, right? Right. I mean, speculative error can be, you know, there, there's always speculative error. But the question is, what's the fundamental thing we're speculating on, right? Um, call it money, call it an asset, doesn't matter. It's not a credit, right? It, it doesn't have, uh, it, nobody owes you anything um, except whatever, the, anybody's willing to trade at any, any given time, which is, uh, call it what you will, right? But um, the, the, the things you mentioned as far as, you know, being a kind of this new digital paradigm, um, the problem with those ideas is that they just don't have any security model, right? Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't rely on any custodian, right? But everything that would be, correlated to it does. So you have this custodial problem, which is pervasive in all of those ideas. In what respect? Why, why, does, that, why does it even matter? If, what does it matter? Because the yeah. custodian, there's no security model against the custodian. Who needs a security model? Why can't it be a new model? It can be new and not secure. There was no option pricing model until they built it, right? Until Black Shells came up with it. It doesn't really matter. Right. That's a concept. We're talking about some uh, Bitcoin as a, either a, uh, a record keeping system for assets, say property deeds, things like that, right? All these, all these things we imagine it being an operating system for, somebody controls those properties, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, this, if the government of Zimbabwe happens to control all the property deeds and decides it wants to take some percentage of that property away from some people and give it to others, Bitcoin recording those property deeds is not gonna stop it because it didn't have a problem finding out who actually owned the property, just took it and gave it to somebody else. That's the custodial problem. It was the custodian of those properties. Anybody who's a custodian is a single point of failure in the system. The reason Bitcoin doesn't have a custodian is because everybody that accepts Bitcoin is a custodian of its value. But well, what's that got to do with the operating system? Why does it matter that there's a single point of failure in an operating system? It's normal, right? That's, that's life. Almost everything has yeah. catastrophic yeah. failure. It doesn't rates. have any security. Sorry? You have a single point of failure and you can operate as long as nobody attacks that single point. Bitcoin's premise is that it can't be attacked that way. It can't, right? It can't be attacked at one point of sale, for example. But anything that relies on Bitcoin as a record keeping system can be. So those things may exist, they do exist, but they're but, not securable, which means it's not a new paradigm. Um, no, that's not necessarily true because the collateral for that entire system is actually based on Bitcoin, right? No. So the collateral of the system is based on Bitcoin, which is the immutable source, right? So you have one source of truth. It's a one source of information. It's not the source of the actual goods that are being compared to it, right? So if we talk about... Keeping no, and again, I'm not saying that. You're literally just saying something that I'm not saying. What I'm saying is the platform at the base of it is Bitcoin, fine. Does that build a whole operating system? Yes. Does that have a value? Of course it does. does it what is that value? We don't know. It's unknowable. Therefore, it has to trade like an option. Does it have security? Doesn't does matter. It? Does it have more security, less security? I don't know. Right. Okay. Well, all I'm saying is it doesn't have security in the sense that Bitcoin has security. It has political security. <laughs> right? It, it doesn't, there's no security model that protects, you know, bit, that protects people's properties in Zimbabwe from getting taken from them and given to somebody else even if they're recorded on the blockchain, right? And when people talk about blockchain technology, aside from money, that's what they're talking about. Custodial problems, right? So I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm not saying they don't have value. I'm saying they're, they're not secured any differently than past systems. That's all. Well, anything can happen, but but still, uh, can can't you just use it as a you know as a as a as a tool of evidence? Uh, you know, because it, absolutely. But you know, but the problems that we see that are fairly large scale problems of this kind, right? Not the occasional lost deed, an entire nation, you know, rearranging property. Those aren't problems of lost property records. Those are problems of people with guns, right? So if somebody, if somebody but this is not your you seem to be. 
raising an issue that's not the problem, right? The problem is not that. Is it better than an existing solution for a number of different reasons? I'm not actually Security not seems to be your primary issue, but it's not anybody else's particular issue. Like, I'm not raising that issue. It's, it's a straw man, right? I'm, I'm only saying that it doesn't have a new security model. I'm not but, saying it's not a different way of doing things. It There's doesn't have a new color either. You know, it's, well, it's, the security it's, model of these things tends to matter to people. They think that when we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about security, you know, immutable, et cetera. Yeah, the blockchain has these properties, right? The Bitcoin has these properties, for example, but they don't extend beyond it. That's what I'm raising. I'm not saying it can't be done. And none of us are saying that it is, but it needs it. Right. But you're saying it's different. It's different in what way? It's a, it's a record keeping system where the records can be completely irrelevant, right? Just like they can be today. The problem we have today with- is it, Will it be adopted? The question is simply that. Well, Not is it perfect? Is it on it that pure, purpose, right? Will it be adopted? Question. It, it, is there a probability? Who, again, is I'm not, making, I'm not making predictions about the future, about what is will there, be adopted. Will there be a probability of more than zero that it could be adopted? I don't know what the probability is. It could be zero, it could be a hundred. How do you calculate the probability of something like that? Okay, so even if the probability is between zero and a hundred, it's positive, mo most likely. And I'm saying Therefore it has not my point. My point is it's not securable any better than what we have today. None of us disagree. Well, it's a common disagreement, so I just like to point it out. But what the but general for, point is, you know, the legal layer supersedes any distributed record keeping for absolutely assets legal or <laughs> illegal <laughs> time i as the point i made earlier i think the interface of whatever distributed consensus mechanism you want to use blockchain etc etc it, it rubs up against the antiquated legal structure it changes over time as we have seen with other examples of digital technologies um, reforming legal structures um, but that is much more of an unknown. So there's kind of two different things. So we're talking about Bitcoin, which is sort of its uh, self-enclosed environment where you can actually hold in custody and have total sovereignty over your asset versus something owning something like land on a blockchain. That doesn't matter. That depends first on uh, the legal recognition of your ownership, your property rights. So they're really two different categories uh, in, in my right. opinion. You have, you have the money and you have everything else, right? And that, that's that's you know, the money can be used to keep records, um, but they can't be secured the way the money is, as you described. You can't hold that as security yourself. You can't, the, the, the system of distributed ownership of Bitcoin doesn't distribute the control over that property. Um, so it can be useful to store records in a way where the reference to the records, not the actual records are, 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 are on this chain but somebody has to honor them first and foremost, where nobody has to honor that record when it comes to Bitcoin. You just have to be willing to do it if it's not allowed. Because the money is, Bitcoin is abstract, whereas most other properties can. Yeah, the big Bitcoin is itself. That's why I mean, when, when I describe it as fiat, it's, it's really nothing but itself. It has no use value um, as, you know, as a money. You can't take it and you know, fill your teeth with it. Um, you know, where it is jewelry. So it's this thing that has no substance. It has no presence other than the information on the chain. And the value of it is only what people are willing to trade. And that value is distributed among all the people who do trade, right? Everybody represents a little bit of the custody of the value of Bitcoin. Um, that's not true with these, these, other, these other systems that want to layer on top of it. All right. Um, let me see. Um, so I, I lost my. <laughs> I lost it. I think. I, um, so, what do you guys think about the network effect? I mean, isn't that isn't that the ultimate uh, trigger uh, for for I call it the critical mass adoption. Isn't that what you just said? That if as many people as possible are, you know, a critical mass starts accepting it and, and valuing it and trading it, and 
you know, and, and starting in this monetary evolutionary phase of store of value, what does it mean? What does it mean for this for this cycle of adoption that we're in? It's got a bigger network. <laughs> okay. right? I mean, it, it presumably is more useful the more things you can buy in the more places, right? From the from more people. So being more useful raises its value. Um, it raises its level of security because now you have to attack more individuals if you want to have them change their say inflation rule, more people to resist. Um, so yeah, those are all, you know, people actually using it in trade is, is what provides that security. If you're not accepting it for anything, you have no say in the consensus rules. Um, so that's another problem with the idea of Bitcoin backing, you know, the monetary system. Who's actually accepting the Bitcoin, right? Who's accepting the gold, right? States between states when they do clearing. So, um, you know, you have a, you end up with a handful of people who get to decide, well, what the rules really are. Um, so that distributed economy um, is essential to not only the value of it, but the security of it, and therefore the existence of it, at least as we know it. So yeah, that's all good. Uh, when you say critical mass, it sounds like you're implying there's some explosion at some point, right? Well, yeah, tipping point. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, in Iran, they just regulated crypto, mi you know, whatever, mining. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, Iran, I mean, I don't care about the regime, but I care about the, the people over there. Um, so, you know, with all the sanctions, embargoes and suffering they're undergoing, uh, Iran has like 80 million people. So what if, you know, just a fraction of it, you know, uh, whatever, 10, 20, 30 million people started accumulating or even the government starts uh you know uh as a reserve asset as you just said robert i think previously uh what if they what if smaller bigger governments and people uh from these nations start accumulating and hoarding it as a reserve asset partially this is what i'm seeing i mean I'm, i know what we can't you, make predictions but what do you what do you, you seem to be like implying something will happen if, if that's the case well we, what would happen people holding bitcoin doesn't actually do anything right they, they just have it they don't even have a say in the consensus rules mm -hmm. well, holding they, does do something holding implies upward pressure on its price yeah yeah, yeah but the price is not the first of all somebody always holds it right this is kind of a you know myth of money right or, or property somebody always holds all property all money changing hands does or having one person hold a lot of it versus you know a lot of people holding a little of it doesn't change that force um it has more to do with um people's demand to use it right so um if, if you're just holding it you don't need to use it right you're just holding it right if somebody needs to go buy something now they're going to pay more for it so they can get it so they can go buy their illegal drugs or whatever so, you know, you, you get a say in the consensus rules when you reject bad money. Somebody gives you some, some Fed coin and you say, well, that's not real money. You can't buy my, you can't buy my stuff. And everybody does that. The Fed coin's not worth anything, right? Because nobody will trade them for it. That's, that's your say. Holding, you know, is like, it's equivalent to lost coin in terms, in that context. I completely disagree with that. Uh, holding is a restriction on supply, which due to supply. And Just as lost coin. Price. Uh, yeah, lost coin. It's fine. Just there's lost coin. It has no it's other effect other than lost coin. The the jargon rabbit hole. You know, money at its very foundations is a technology for moving value across time and space. Moving. The network moving is what the key word there. The number of holders of that money or users of that money that is proportionate to the liquidity. That is the value. Of the <laughs> if everybody holds it, this it's worth zero. This is the same right. as. Metcalf's law as it applies to phones, right? If there's five people that, that own a phone, then you have uh, a certain amount of connections possible. If twice as many own a phone, you have an exponentially more possible yeah. connections. I understand that. But so as, as, as money evolves, as we're seeing you know, with Bitcoin becoming monetized, it's in this stage one store of value, right? Which is the same thing we saw with gold. It was first a store of value, over time, as it became sufficiently distributed, it became a medium of exchange. And then ultimately, it was a unit of account, as it was so ingrained in, in our cognitive machinery for price of goods. I think, I think even Mises would disagree with that approach. It became a medium of exchange before it became useful to store value. Okay. That's <laughs> to me, that's not a reason. The point is, it, it, 
money as a single, singular purpose technology for moving value across time and space exhibits a winner take all dynamic. Right. And again, this gets back to game theory. It's like you cannot, as you know, safety says, you cannot insulate yourself from others holding money that is harder than yours, right? If someone can produce over <laughs> at a marginal cost, it's less than marginal revenue, they have a direct financial incentive to, to shelter their profits and store them in the hardest monetary medium available, which historically was gold, and which is now, due to the stock to flow ratio uh, increase of Bitcoin, will become Bitcoin um, sometime after this happening. So I think in general, it's, yeah, it is probabilistic, and we can argue about the supply and demand economics of money, but at its core, uh, you know, Bitcoin better satisfies these traits of money than any other technology we've ever had. So I, I disagree with the use of Metcalf's law and applying it to people only holding, right? If everybody only holds, there's no network at all. Nobody's communicating, right? This network that we're talking about is trade, people actually buying stuff from each other. Holding is not trading. So if everybody holds, nobody can buy anything, right? Nobody does buy anything. There's not, not only no security in the money, so what you, you're, you're, you're using the argument that holding is valuable, but you're trying to justify that with an argument that's actually based on trade, right? And I agree with your argument on trade. The more people that are actually interacting with the money using it, not only the more secure it is, but the more valuable it is. So my, my point is just that this idea of everybody just storing, right, doesn't actually work in Bitcoin because there's actually nobody eventually nobody paying for mining yeah yeah and there's nobody actually able to get anything from their money because nobody's accepting it yeah but that's not an absolute statement eric nobody we've got approximately that's an estimate and a scientific estimate or whatever a serious estimate of 50 million people maybe even more uh holding or whatever hodling or transacting with bitcoin Boy. so all of these people do not hold a hoard the, ho the whole time. Yeah, but they are also like people with Andreas Antonopoulos. They are exchanging. They are paying their, you know, their contractors, their people in Bitcoin. And they're buying dollars and selling dollars, right? No, no. Some of them, no. Some of them, seriously, they are already just exchanging a Bitcoin. Right. But that, that's my point. That is what is providing the value. Right. Yeah, but more, yeah, but the more people are hoarding it, the more exponential whatever the critical yeah. number is, whether it's a billion people, a hundred million people, this it will. Holding. holding is holding for the future optionality it gives you in exchange, right? If I'm holding Bitcoin today at thirteen thousand dollars and I expect it to go to a hundred thousand, when it gets there or whatever my target is, that's when I there, use yeah. it as a medium of exchange. This is exactly. The and you sell off, you skim off, you sell off that cream on top of that. That's what people do, actually. If everyone holding reduces the value of money, it doesn't make any sense. If everyone's holding, the value of money is infinity, right? No, because it's zero. You can't money. buy anything. <laughs> Nobody's accepting it. I disagree. The value of gold is zero if nobody accepts it. Well, then in the future, somebody has to accept it, right? Of course. Okay, so it's not worth anything until somebody accepts it. Gold is not worth anything if nobody will trade for you. Trade, no. trade it Gold's or something. Gold's value was derived on the free market and it still has value okay. today. Nothing, nothing has value in, uh, on the market unless the market will trade for it. It, ha it might have utility to you, but right. Bitcoin has no utility oh, on its own. It's circular. Of course, nothing has market value unless it's traded for. That's what a market is. So right. I'm, I'm, the market must trade. Bro, so, uh, what, what, sorry, can you, can you tell us, what's your understanding? What is it? I mean, I know you are, you're, you're a little bit too quiet right now, so. We started arguing over semantics all the time. So yeah, it's yeah. Really not going anywhere apart from random arguments about points that really don't matter to the general. If this was supposed to be a, um, a discussion for people who are, have a, an initial interest in the area. We're going down the very wrong path here. Nobody's going to understand any of this and it's, literally irrelevant to most people so that's why i'm quiet <laughs> all right closing remarks i, I agree with that bro. <laughs> i would remark that i think people would be wise to understand what it is and how it works and uh you know there's an awful lot of information on out there about how to speculate on it what it's going to be worth um, I find most of it to be baseless, and I think people should understand that, at least should hear that point of view. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, maybe something 
we know that we don't know, and that is the unprecedentedness of this monetary evolution. We have never had that, have we? We never have that. A scarce as hard as money. I mean, in that never... kind of for in that form, in that shape, we never had that. We we people probably our grandparents don't even know what it's like to live under a gold standard. Not even well, our grandparents. So we're talking about Bitcoin now, the scarcest money that is beyond the scarcity of, of the relative scarcity, beyond the relative scarcity of gold. I'm just saying, I don't know, are we, are we really understanding all the facets of this? What, what I don't understand is yeah. why people will say things like, it's the scarcest money without saying the other things that make it the scarcest money. It's unique in more than one way. It's unique in that it has fixed supply. What's the cost of that fixed supply? Fees. No other money or any other asset that I can think of has an inherent fee that goes up when other people are trading it, right? Mm. So that is, a, that is a consequence of the fixed supply. No other money or any other asset that I know of can be destroyed all over the world from a single point on the planet. So people tend to emphasize the aspects that they like and ignore the aspects that don't don't seem to, you know, don't seem to favor their position. And, and I'm out there saying, hey, like, listen, there's consequences that are real and significant to these other aspects that are also unique to Bitcoin. Those two, those two characteristics do not exist in anything else that I know of. So All right. people should be aware of that. All right. So if people, our listeners and viewers, uh, I'm, I'm sure if they trust their own intelligence and reflect and you know uh, go through this comprehension process, I'm sure they've learned a lot through this discussion. And because uh, it's all about, you know, reflection, inspiration. Uh, so, gentlemen, would you just, you know, give me a closing remark or a vision, something positive for people to, uh, to know, you know, it's about humanity. I mean, what is Bitcoin about? It's about freedom, right? It's about, I mean, we've got to break this down. What is it about human rights, about freedom? It's about a total fundamentally new soil, a fundamentally new architecture. We've never had that. And I don't know what I don't know. I mean, what, what do I know? But, uh, and we're definitely not here to make predictions, but it cannot get worse than that, right? Well, and what we have I mean, right now. As we touched on repeatedly in this particular episode is that the future is unknowable, right? So therefore all action is speculative by nature. Uh, money is the antidote to that. That's what money is. It is, it is the most marketable good in a trade network. It can be readily exchanged for basically anything, right? Giving its holder or user uh, as much optionality as possible into the future. So in that respect, um, I think it's very important to understand that today we're at the very end of this 100 year uh, experiment called fiat currency. But for the 5,000 years of commercial human history, we've always had money determined on the free market. Um, and in, do, in that evolution, uh, the gold basically became dominant due to its, its superior scarcity. So, and it's important to remember that there's, there, we often distinguish between free markets and centrally planned markets, but really even a centrally planned market is just obstructing uh, free market dynamics effectively. So when you look at Bitcoin through that lens, uh, its reemergence is actually a reversion back to the normal way of things, right? Back to the way we did things the first 4,900 out of 5,000 years. Um, and, you know, to your point, we have never seen the monetization of an economic good like this in real time. You know, it only really happened with gold, um, which took a long time and, and uh, happened sort of as the world became more interconnected um, via telecommunications and such. So this is, uh, I would say, even more than once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, of course, the future is unknown. But anything can happen. But I, I think this invention in particular warrants uh, very close scrutiny um, for, for anyone that, that ever has to use money, which is everyone. So that's my piece. Yeah, and I would completely agree with all of that. And in addition, it also offers a number of solutions some of them may be imperfect, but for a different way of, of um, dealing with the whole financial system and architecture. And I think that alone is something that is needed and interesting. What is the value of that? It's a lot more than Bitcoin is today. 
It could be zero, it could not, well, it's unlikely to be zero, but the point being is the probability, and again, we're going to be talking probabilities because we have no certainties, is that there is something much larger to come from this, and therefore it has value. And it's interesting, super interesting. It's a, it is optimistic, and a financial system that always feels a place full of pessimists, the Bitcoin world generally, um, generally offers some sort of optimism, unless you take the apocalyptical view, which is sometimes held within that area. Thank you. Eric, um, say My something. perspective is that Bitcoin is very good at doing what it's designed to do, which is to allow people to, to transact in a money that is independent of the state. Uh, it's a proposition is in saving people money, ultimately, right? Either, you know, in, in, very, in various forms, saving people the inflation tax if they're willing to, to use the money and um, allowing people to transact more opaquely um, to the extent that Bitcoin uh, exhibits privacy, which will hopefully, hopefully get better. Um, and saving people money is, is what, you know, a better money is all about. Um, and that savings comes from the avoidance of what is essentially tax. All those things that we like to think are cool about Bitcoin would be very easy to do if they weren't prohibited. So, um, we're, we're giving ourselves permission to do those things. And that is important. We had the ability to do those things with gold. And now we have a global electronic economy. Gold's not useful in that model. So now we have a useful replacement that we... Uh, we can use to do all kinds of cool things because we're not asking for permission. Um, so I think that is awesome. It's cool. Uh, a lot of times when I talk, people think it's so negative on Bitcoin. I've been, I've been writing core code for over five years. I mean, I'm not negative on Bitcoin, but um, you know, I'm not a cheerleader either. It's not the objective. It's to be realistic about what we're doing and, and, uh, and, uh, and build things that have a realistic chance of succeeding. So, um, I think it's new, it's different, it's important, and, um, but it has limitations and it has uh, a scope that I think is narrower than people assume. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your perspectives and your vision, most of all. Um, Robert, Raul, Eric, thank you so much. I hope we can repeat this while, you know, cheering with a glass of rum in the near future <laughs> maybe we can even buy the rum with the bitcoin on the lightning network or whatever <laughs> that would be awesome then i know we've reached a critical mass adoption <laughs> which is whatever my naive uh, vision and dream that you know more and more people exponentially you know wake up to this new reality or create their own reality and we've got to really break this down so people understand why bitcoin you know understanding the question first why bitcoin because uh, it's, it's not about the symptoms, it's about the roots of our structure, of our system, of our interaction. And this, this got to change. This got to change fundamentally. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about praxeology and all these, you know, uh, fancy words in Austrian economics, but maybe we should live it like, you know, action of human beings. Maybe people should really go into action. That's what it means, right? Study of the action of human beings. So, yeah. It's uh, really, I learned a lot. I'm sure our viewers and listeners did too. And hope, you know, to see you soon, hopefully in person. I'll see Robert, hopefully in your future in Europe. <laughs> and <laughs> Eric, Raul, thank you so much again. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks very much. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>